The natural resources of northern Michigan are changing. Lakes and streams, wetlands and uplands, and forests of all kinds are showing the impacts of development, the invasion of non-native plants and animals, and the changing climate. The natural beauty, clean waters, and abundant wildlife that we hold so dear are at risk. But what are those risks? And just what is changing? How are resource managers and community organizations responding? And what can we do to help preserve the best of what's left? Welcome to Nature Change. I'm your host, Joe Vandermeulen. In this program, we'll learn about some dangerous plants invading northern Michigan and meet some of the natural resource experts and volunteer conservationists who are combating these invaders. We begin with the garlic mustard invasion of the Clay Cliffs Preserve in Leelanau County. This video was first published on our website, naturechange.org, in the spring of 2016. There's a wicked invader spreading across Leelanau County and all of northern Michigan. Garlic mustard overtakes native plants to create a monoculture. This invasive plant steals the light, water, and space from native wildflowers. Worse, the plants are toxic to the larvae of native butterflies, and some of the chemicals released by garlic mustard can inhibit growth of other plants. Researchers say these chemicals also reduce the survival of tree seedlings. So Leelanau Conservancy and the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network have declared war on garlic mustard. I see it growing everywhere, as in sometimes there's certain invasive plants that tend to occupy disturbed areas, and yes, this garlic mustard site is disturbed and it really likes disturbed areas, but I will see it growing in the middle of a beautiful pristine forest. It just takes one seed to get dropped. It grows in monocultures where within the areas that it's growing nothing else can grow it uh, it can just dominate an entire forest and eventually just become a carpet of garlic mustard where there's nothing else growing and um, that's just not a healthy ecosystem there's a, many different ways you can control garlic mustard hand pulling is a really effective way um, if if you can get the root up um, that's a great way. Um, you can use herbicide as well, but we're looking at finding some al other alternatives to controlling garlic mustard. So we have these propane backpacks that have torches and really it's ideally going to be more effective to kill the seedlings. We're just looking for ways that we can quickly come in and do a control method that will speed up the process. And, you know, in a spot like this, we know that the seed bank is probably pretty dense and so if anything I just want to f start flushing the seeds out of the soil and we know that this is going to be a commitment to be controlling the site. We could be here for 10 years or more. The Leelanau Conservancy and Invasive Species Network are gathering armies of workers and volunteers to fight the invaders. This battle is at the Conservancy's Clay Cliffs natural area. Clay Cliffs is a wonderful natural area. There's an amazing clay bluff along the Lake Michigan shoreline, which is a rare landform here in Michigan. So it was a big effort to protect it. And we got an amazing forest along with it. And unfortunately, an infestation of garlic mustard as well. So we're trying to control the garlic mustard so that it won't spread further into the forest. Um, right here we have the second year plants, which these, um, these grew from seed last spring and they start as these tiny little seedlings and then they grow into this rosette and they overwinter like that. So now this is what's from last year and this is what we'll be pulling and then all the little tiny seedlings we'll be torching to try to control those so that next year there's hopefully less of them to pull out. This is definitely something you can do at home. In fact, if you see it growing, you want to try to pull it before, ideally before it's flowering, definitely before it's fruiting and seeding, because if you're pulling it when it's fruiting and seeding, you could potentially spread the seed further. You just make sure all this is coming out with it. You should definitely pull it if it's at your house. And then you can eat it. You can, you can eat it before it's flowering. <laughs> 
One of the tricky things with invasive plant management is trying to prioritize the work that we do because it can seem overwhelming. You know, if we can find those little satellite populations of even just one plant here or a small clump of plants that we can keep from going to seed and spreading further up into the forest, that's what, those are the spots we really want to get. And then as time allows, we can work on these spots too. This is a great spot for, with volunteers. If we can get just a group of people to come and just pull all this, that's great. But I mean, ideally we want to get all the plants from going to seed. We have a lot of volunteer work days set up. You can look at our website to find out more about our work days. We have them on weekdays, we have them on the weekend. It's at many different uh, natural areas throughout Leelanau County you can meet up with us and pull garlic mustard. It's, I think it's fun. It's, it's a great time to be out in the forest because all the spring ephemerals are blooming and you may even find some morel mushrooms while you're at it and so it's a fun time I think just to be with friends in the forest <laughs> weeding the forest. I believe it's possible to eradicate garlic mustard. I believe that it takes a huge amount of effort and many years of work but I think that it's doable if you're diligent and I think it's super important to to work to eradicate it because it does create monocultures and then you have an unhealthy ecosystem. A short time ago, Nature Change returned to the Clay Cliffs Preserve to talk with Leelanau Conservancy's Becky Hill. We asked her if there's been any success battling garlic mustard and whether she thinks it's worth the effort. We've been controlling garlic mustard here for quite a few years. I mean, even earlier than um, what you saw in that last video. But we've had another full season of garlic mustard control here. and. I think, you know, we've made some good progress in some ways and then not in other ways. Uh, what you saw us working on was one of the bigger, in, there's kind of a core infestation here where there is just solid garlic mustard. There's nothing else growing there but invasive garlic mustard. And then scattered throughout Clay Cliffs property, there's what we call satellite populations where, you know, in the first year, the plant, well, Garlic mustard is a biennial plant, which means it, it grows for two years. And in the second year, it drops its seeds. And the first, so you find these spots where there's just a perfect circle of garlic mustard out in the middle of the forest. And you can tell that that was probably from one plant dropping its seeds. But then that seed source, then the next year turns into a bigger circle of garlic mustard. And then it goes, gets bigger and bigger from there. So it can grow very rapidly as far as infestation and this past year we really started to see more scattered satellite populations so these isolated you know one plant group of plants just out in the middle of a forest where you know it just doesn't seem like it would be growing there and that's what we really had to put a lot of our focus on this year was trying to get those individual plants pulled because that's where it all starts you know one plant can do a lot of damage and we, and the thing is, is you have to do multiple rounds of it. You might pull in early May, but then need to go back again in early June or a few weeks later just to make sure that you get it all. Because even when you think you have it all, you don't. And that is, that's what's the hardest thing is it, you have to cover a lot of ground and then cover a lot of ground again just to make sure that you get it all. And it's just, it's just a lot of work and um, we had a lot of great volunteers and staff helping this year, but we need more. I mean, it just seems like every year we need more. We, we basically feel like we need an army <laughs> to, to pull garlic mustard. I'm not gonna lie, there were many points this spring where I just felt that way like I wanted to throw my hands in the air and just say forget it we can't we can't do this anymore and you know to a certain extent I mean you have to prioritize the areas that you focus in and you know one of our we definitely want to focus on those smaller satellite populations that are spread further away from the main infestation and then try and just contain the infestation and if we can't get to all of it 
that's fine. I mean, we, of course we want to get to all of it, but if we can't, we just have to prioritize where we do that. And, and also, you know, really focusing on the high um, diversity, you know, more ecologically diverse areas versus um, these infestations or old, you know, the old fields and old home sites that maybe are, don't have quite as much um, ecological benefit and prioritizing where we focus our work. No, I no. there are definitely invasive plants like that that I think have reached that point where it's maybe not worth the effort, but I don't believe garlic mustard is at that point yet. I still think it's really worthwhile. From the clay cliffs north of Leland, we move our focus south along Michigan's west coast to the city of Manistee and the battle with another invading plant, Japanese knotweed first published on naturechange.org about one year ago in August of 2016, we called this video Monster Weed. Like criminals on an FBI list, some of their names will be familiar the 20 least wanted list of invasive plants in northwest lower Michigan. Invasive plants, animals, and other organisms are called invasive species when they are not native to the ecosystems of our region and are likely to cause real economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. This video is about a really fast-growing invasive plant called Japanese knotweed and what's being done to fight the invader in the Manistee City area. Here's Katie Grishek coordinator of the Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network. Japanese knotweed is an invasive species, which means it's not native to the United States. Um, and it also causes harm to the environment and to our infrastructure, to our roads, to our buildings, um, because it's able to bust right through those foundations. Uh, one of the biggest problems with Japanese knotweed is that it's actually able to spread not only by seed, but also by fragments. So if you mow or cut, uh, the Japanese knotweed and then throw it in a compost pile, for example, even a piece as big as just an inch long can grow into a whole new plant. One of the other issues is climate change. Um, as the temperature increases, as our winters get less severe overall, um, Japanese knotweed has a bit of a competitive advantage. It's able to stay growing a little longer, put more resources down into its roots, and when the frosts don't kill it back, because you know it doesn't frost till later, it's able to grow even longer. And if that little fragment, which might have died otherwise, then doesn't die because the frost didn't come yet and is able to put down roots and save itself, um, Japanese knotweed is gonna continue to just keep growing and growing and growing. We found that the most effective way to control Japanese knotweed is using herbicides. Crew chief Fields Ratliff says they have a short time frame to get out and chemically treat knotweed throughout the area. Um, today we're doing a, a chemical application of Japanese knotweed, which is the most effective. Um, it's a foliar spray using um, a pump backpack sprayer to mist and cover the leaves of the plant. That's 90% that's of what we do, but we also do a, a cut stump application for um, areas where the, the plant might be by sensitive trees, uh, shrubs, whatever, we, we cut it off lay it down and then we fill the, the stump with the product and that goes down in the roots and kills it and it also we don't have to worry about getting the foliar spray on, on other sensitive uh, plants. We had a lot of folks from throughout Manistee County saying hey what about Veterans Oak Grove Drive? What about I know where if you want Japanese knotweed I know where there's tons of it let's head over there but unfortunately it's too big of, um, of a population for us to hit before but with this new grant from the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program we have the funds now to be able to do that. So we've been working with everybody from private landowners all the way up to the city of Manistee that owns some land there and, and does some of the roadside management. Jeff McCoola is the director of public works for the city of Manistee. He knows that fighting off this invader needs to be a real cooperative effort. Uh, this plan has encroached into the roadway, hanging over. Uh, we try to trim it back. It comes right back bigger and nastier than ever. Uh, we've also seen that it pokes up through the asphalt um, and so it's very destructive to the infrastructure. Um, it's grown not just in the right-of-ways, but it's grown beyond the right-of-ways onto the private property. So even if the city took this on by itself to uh, handle what's in our right-of-way, there still had to be some efforts with the prop you know, adjoining property owners. 
So we're very pleased that that's being coordinated and happening now. Manistee resident Mary Hurley and her neighbors recognized the threat from knotweed a few years ago and helped bring the Invasive Species Network to the city of Manistee. Prior to this, our main control or our concern had been Phragmites, which we all know about and we, know, and it, we see it around the water features all around us as well as on the drainage ditches on the road and we had seen it here along Veterans Drive. Um, thinking that that was the, you know, the, the evil weed to be eradicated. And about two or three years ago, um, all of a sudden it started being replaced by this, this plant, um, which we now know is, you know, the Japanese knotweed. And so um, we really are happy to see that the city is taking part in it because we feel like it's coming to us from this area along Veterans Drive. And, and while we've already started treating it through, you know, with the help of the species, Invasive Species Network, um, we know that if we eradicate it on our property, and it's not eradicated here, it's not going to do us a lot of good. The most effective way of getting rid of this invasive species is through chemical treatment. Um, so I think in order to be safe, not just for our workers, but for the public as well, um, I appreciate that there are trained people that are coming out applying that. Anywhere a person is who would happen to notice this plant and knowing how, how invasive it is and how damaging it can be, that you find your local office, um, you know, which are available on all the government websites, to find someone to come out and help you eradicate it. To get an update on how the battle with Japanese knotweed is going, Nature Change returned to Manistee in the site of the infestation and talked once again with Katie Grishak, coordinator for the Invasive Species Network in Northwest Michigan. So about a year ago, um, we were right here on this spot at this exact infestation right behind me um, and working with the city of Manistee um, and the Oak Grove Cemetery and, and several other partners, including local landowners, um, to treat Japanese knotweed using funds mainly from the Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program, but is also the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. Um, and so we were able to treat last year at the end of the summer um, and then we treated again the spring of 2017 and then a third time in the late summer of 2017. So the really exciting thing is that even though Japanese knotweed is a plant that usually takes anywhere between two to seven years to control, and this is a really, really massive infestation, one of the largest in our service area of four counties, um, we've made a really, really big dent. You can see behind me, most of the knotweed is dead. There are definitely still some coming up. We're definitely still working on treatment. We're not gonna be done tomorrow, but we've made a really, really big impact. Um, and the goal with these treatments is that um, if the invasive species network evaporated and died tomorrow, that local partners would be able to keep it up and keep making a big difference. Obviously, hopefully the invasive species network continues to exist um, so that we can keep working on this, but to keep it down to a manageable level. And that's exactly what's happening. So, so one of the really exciting things that we saw when we came back and visited this site this year is that, of course, a lot of stuff looks very, very dead from the Japanese knotweed. But in some areas where the Japanese knotweed wasn't very thick, we actually have some native plants already coming in. Um, and one of the most exciting ones is milkweed, which is, of course, a common weed that grows in every ditch ever. Um, but it's also a really important host plant for the monarch butterfly. So when we're able to see that plant coming back, um, it gets us excited for the habitat as a whole. But definitely, as you move throughout different habitats, different invasive species become priorities. So garlic mustard in woodlands is often a big deal. Phragmites in wetlands is really important. Um, and we're also thinking now about Japanese barberry. Um, it's an invasive shrub that is all commonly planted in gardens again. Um, but it is a big deal in forests. Um, it crowds out native plants and is actually a really big problem with ticks. Um, ticks are able to live there better than they're able to live in a lot of other places and cause some human harm from that as well. Even autumn olive and knapweed, two of the invasive species that seem to be absolutely everywhere, there are spaces that they're still really crucial to control. Areas like the Sleeping Bear Dunes or the Grand Sable Dunes up at Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore don't have that much of it or it's in an ecosystem where even all of the knapweed is a really big deal or autumn olive, maybe there isn't that much of it in a really beautiful wetland and we want to work to keep it that way. And so that's why those local level things are very important. But at a statewide level, we know that autumn olive is everywhere. And so it's just working to keep them out of those really special spaces in some cases. 
The last of our series of video essays on invasive plants is set in a small neighborhood just south of the village of Onekama. This video was prepared last spring, 2017, and focuses on Japanese barberry. Imported from Japan a long time ago, Japanese barberry was used for landscaping around homes and buildings for years. Plant nurseries like this shrub because it's very hardy, drought tolerant, and deer don't like it. And its dense woody branches can sport dark green, yellow, or purple leaves, as well as lots of thorns, and pretty red berries in the fall. But Japanese barberry is a dangerous plant. The Northwest Michigan Invasive Species Network says this is one of the nastiest invasive plants in our region. In the wild, barberry is a real menace to natural habitats and human health because it forms dense thickets that offer a perfect setting for mice and ticks that carry Lyme disease. Emily Cook is a project manager for the Invasive Species Network housed at the Grand Traverse Conservation District. The main issue with this plant is that it's still sold as an ornamental, so people are still planting it. Um, and from there, it's moving on to these areas we really care about. Um, it grows into the forest. It's got a lot of seeds that birds love. They eat it and then they drop those seeds and it can grow anywhere. It's extremely shade tolerant, so it's going to show up in our forests, um, suppressing any of those really good tree seedlings that are coming up to encourage forest regeneration. Any of those spring ephemerals, trillium, you won't see that in an area that's infested with this Japanese barberry. Apparently, there are lots of infestations of Japanese barberry in northern Michigan, and once it takes hold, it can be hard to get rid of. Onekama resident, Lenise Hensel, helped to lead a barberry removal effort in her forested neighborhood just south of Portage Lake. So I could see that it was growing here, uh, around in my woods, and getting way out of control, and so I contacted the Invasive Species Network, and they said that they could probably help me. But they said I had to have the okay from all my neighbors first. So I contacted all my neighbors, explained to them with uh, handouts what is so bad about Japanese barberry, and had to convince them that it needed to be gone, and so I did convince them. The Invasive Species Network hosts work bees to help remove these pests, providing training and equipment and helping to coordinate volunteer labor. This is the second work bee at Hensel's neighborhood. The volunteers marched in to remove barberry remaining around neighborhood homes, then went to work on infestations in the nearby woods. There have been some studies done that show a link between the plant and uh, black-legged ticks, which hosts uh, Lyme disease, which obviously is something that we are concerned about. And then we're finding out that this plant kind of creates this perfect humid environment for those ticks. A specialist with the Invasive Species Network, Fields Ratliff, says barberry really can be controlled. You need good tick repellent on your clothes, heavy gloves, a shovel, some loppers, and just a little herbicide like Roundup for the big stems. If possible, he says, dig out the whole root ball. So you can see that this is the root ball and the majority of the roots came out so this plant will die. If you were just to cut it at the surface, the plant will return the, the following year. One thing that landowners can do when they, they're in their yard and they think, you know, they see these plants and maybe they've introduced themselves from a neighbor's property or perhaps they paid a landscaper to put in Japanese barberry but now they don't want it anymore. First step is removing that plant and then replacing it with an alternative. And there are so many amazing native or at least non-invasive alternatives they can put in their yard that aren't going to spread and also support the wildlife and those pollinators. And ISN, the Invasive Species Network, is hosting an event in May to actually encourage this and give you a little reward for doing so that you can bring your Japanese barberry plants from your yard to us and we will give you a coupon for a non-invasive alternative to a local nursery or landscaper. So we're, in, we're encouraging that replacement and getting those natives back in the land. To get one final update for this program, we met with Emily Cook from the Invasive Species Network in the same neighborhood shown in our last essay. We asked Emily just how challenging she thinks barberry is. Barberry, I would 
say it's pretty bad, but it's been one that's kind of was at the bottom of our list. Maybe even just a few years ago, we were aware it was an issue, but recently it's creeped more towards the top. Um, we've become more aware of areas where barberry has gone beyond uh, individuals' garden or landscape and moved into natural areas that we really care about. So we're starting to focus on it a bit more. Um, it's a plant that we think you know, there's a lot of it, but we think we might be able to win uh, some battles in areas that aren't completely out of control yet. It's, it's one that is potentially manageable compared to some other invasives that are quite out of control and we just can't put resources toward at this point. And it really depends on the ambition of, like I said, the neighborhood where you're in. Um, if you have a situation like this where it's kind of in everyone's yards or it's in the woods behind everyone's homes, you really need a lot of people on board to get this under control. It's hard to um, remove barberry in an area uh, and then have, say, a neighbor down the road who's not doing anything to manage their issue. It kind of it makes your effort seem uh, like maybe they'll go to waste in a couple of years when the plants start spreading again. I think Lanisa's role was absolutely crucial. We didn't, we weren't even aware of the barberry issue um, up on this hillside and in this neighborhood before she contacted me a couple of years ago. Um, she's very aware of invasive species issues and their impact on native plants. So she saw a situation happening and she wanted to get it under control. Um, the Invasive Species Network, we're just a handful of people. We can't see every nook and cranny of Northwest Michigan. So it's so important to have these folks who are aware of the issues getting a hold of us when they see an outbreak that might be able to be managed at some point. Yeah. What's next? We're continuing to target barberry growing in landscape, so that barberry that was planted on purpose. Um, those are the host plants for a lot of these outbreaks we're seeing other places and going into these natural areas. Uh, the great thing about Northwest Michigan is we have nature all around us, so you'll have these little communities um, surrounded by national park and national forests, but within these communities you have businesses that have barberry planted all around them. And that's kind of the, the area we're focusing on to prevent those little pockets of barberry from spreading into the really beautiful areas around them.